Are you all able to see the screen that I've shared? Yes. Yeah. Well, Thank good you. afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we uh, meet today and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so today's session is about or has arisen from a SALT um, grant project that was conducted by Joe, myself and Ed Pember from the School of Access Education. And we explored the views of sessional staff about academic misconduct, particularly to understand the challenges and areas where uh, they feel that improvement is needed. And hence, I posted a question there to see if we've got any sessional staff here attending today, because we had um, gone out to sessional staff. Now, there's one. There's, there's one. one. Okay. Uh, I do know um, a few people attended when we uh, presented uh, something similar in the virtual SALT um, conference. Um, as I've said in the chat um, screen there, Joe is online. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, ask. Now, before I start looking at what this project was about, I just want to clarify the, the, the definition of academic integrity as defined by CQ University and CQ University's academic integrity policy. Previously, it was called student misconduct procedure. So that's been um, succeeded by this newer policy. And in fact, this, this definition of academic integrity, uh, sorry, uh, do you see the next screen or has it gone further or no? No, still on oh. the slide, Ritesh. Okay, that's a bit unusual. Yep. There, now you're good. Good. <clears throat> so, um, so the definition is actually guided by a Texas guidance note, which, um, which outlines or provides a definition of academic integrity. Their focus of academic integrity um, is underpinned by values of honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, and courage. When I dissect that definition and think about courage, you know, why, why is courage important? It's not courage for people to actually engage in academic misconduct. It's the courage that I think organizations need to show in dealing with academic misconduct incidents. Especially, it's not you find an academic misconduct incident, you don't push it under the rug. I think it's important for everyone to be made aware of it. And in, in doing so, you know, my personal policy, for example, you know, I, I mean, when I, when I interact with my teaching staff, I say, well, there's no harm in adopting a big brother attitude, but obviously in a supportive sense. Your students also need to know that you know about academic misconduct. Sometimes, you know, our students think, oh, well, my teaching staff's not necessarily aware of contract cheating. Yes, we know plagiarism. We all keep talking about plagiarism. But on a personal level, I encourage my staff, my people who are working with me when I'm the unit coordinator, to actually go and use the word contract cheating in the classroom with them. Tell them that you know about it because then they are more aware. So that's why courage is important, is an important element. And academic integrity is not just from an educational perspective. It also applies to our research communities because a lot of us undertake research and that is also bound up with these principles of academic integrity. So it doesn't just apply to students, it applies for researchers as well. What sort of academic integrity breaches? Because we've come a far away from plagiarism. Plagiarism, I think, was a word we, we, we commonly used five years ago. Now, I think it's not just plagiarism. The bigger problem now that is emerging is contract cheating. You know, we've got plagiarism, we have self-plagiarism, we have collusion, we have cheating, and contract cheating is becoming a bigger problem. In fact, when I say problem, sometimes, you know, uh, I get limited by the fact that if I'm at work and I need to look for a contract cheating website, I'm not able to. Because, you know, I can go looking for an assessment just to see whether my assessment, some student has uploaded it online. 
But when I'm at work, I get blocked by the filters. Now that's you know a problem if I need to even identify um, cases of contract cheating. And I think we need to work around that. My work around, uh, around that is if I'm at work, I then connect through my uh, mobile connection and use Bluetooth tethering because then obviously it's not going through CQ network. It goes through my mobile data network and then I, you know, I can, can, can do my research in trying to find whether there was actually plagiarism in or contract cheating cases. Um, so if you look at that cartoon, it says, this is an outstanding essay, Roger, the author gets an A and you get an F. I think we should all be doing it. One of the problems that we identify, and I'm going to come to that, is the amount of time it takes to resolve plagiarism issues. Okay. And that came out clearly as well. Um, so what was the need of the project? Academic misconduct incidents have increased dramatically. There is no denial, no one in academia, not just in Australia. I think it's a, it's a global problem, which, which, which gets widely reported, at least in the Western world. You know, um, students coming from the subcontinent often may not have uh, that, 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 that culture of report writing and hence are not sure. In fact, it is also prevalent, not just in students coming from there. There are reports that also allude to academics of ghost, uh, sorry, problems of ghost writing and plagiarism in academia. So uh, teaching staff need to have a common understanding of academic integrity and academic misconduct. So there has to be clarity around that. And we obviously wanted to understand what sessional staff uh, feel and understand about those two. Academic integrity research tends to concentrate on the needs of academic staff and not sessional academic staff. In fact, when we, when we started this research, you know, even now there's, there, there, there is no research that I am aware of that looks at sessional staff. All prior research looks at this issue from the perspective of full-time or continuing academic staff. Um, so Ritesh, <clears throat> yep. uh, somebody has messaged me privately asking why we concentrated on sessional staff and not full-time staff. So yep. that, that was one of the reasons why we did it is because they're, they're, they're people who are unheard in the, uh, in the literature at the moment, um, but they're an important resource for our teaching model. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Thanks for keeping an eye on the chat room, Joe. Um, and also the need stemmed from Texas requirements. So I alluded to that guidance note uh, in 2017. And Texa, uh, I think, had three or four guidelines, three or four prominent guidelines that said organizational institutions have to promote and uphold academic integrity. They also said educational institutions need to take actions to mitigate risks or foreseeable risks. There was also one of the other items that they, they, they had mentioned was to provide students and staff with guidance and training on what constitutes academic uh, uh, misconduct and the development of good practices as well. And I think the fourth one was um, um, that um, I think it was, it, it talked about how these arrangements can also include third parties in, in, that are involved in the provision of um, software, for example, you know, turn it in and what role they play, uh, what role does studi studiosity play in ensuring that these academic standards are withheld. And obviously, when you go and look at these th third party providers such as Turnitin and Stud uh, Studiosity, they are now, you know, playing an important role in, in, in curbing um, cases of academic misconduct here, uh, plagiarism and contract cheating. So in, in, in terms of contract cheating, when you look at the recent work Turnitin is doing is um, they're, they're now, so if a student submits an assignment, they're when they run it through a previous student's assignment, it tells you whether it is the same writing style. So that's a trial they're undertaking. So in other words, they're looking at style. Now what that means is when a student does contract cheating, they might have, they might have commissioned two different authors. So what the Turnitin software will tell you is it's the same style as the first one. And then obviously, you know, you say, oh, that, 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 that is, doesn't seem 
it's the same person's writing, if you know what I mean. Does that make sense? So that's um, uh, the reasons that we um, embarked on this project and uh, we aim to fill those gaps in. Um, then going further, I'm not sure what's happening here. Yep. Um, so we wanted to understand the problems that sessional, sessional academic staff encounter with respect to teaching students about academic integrity and dealing with academic misconduct. That was the overarching aim. In, in doing so, there were three different um, impacts that we wanted to make. And those impacts were a transformational impact. That, that means teaching staff will be able to, uh, to, to improve the awareness of students about these concepts. So that is your transformational impact. From a transactional impact, we wanted staff to use the knowledge and skills that they gain in marking and moderation processes. So in other words, in administrative processes. And finally, an institutional impact, because from an institutional perspective, what we all want is a reduction in the cases of academic misconduct. So these were the three different impacts that we um, wanted to achieve from the study. Transformational, which I repeat, is to improve the awareness of students in terms of academic uh, integrity and misconduct. Secondly, trans uh, transactional, which is so that staff can use the knowledge and skills in marking and other uh, moderation and administrative processes. And finally, um, a reduction in the cases of academic misconduct, which is your institutional impact. Um, then going ahead, um, our research design, we conducted focus groups because um, focus groups provide us um, detailed set of data about perception, thoughts, feelings, impressions of people. In order to reach the right sample size, we were guided by previous research by Guest, Nami, and McKenna that said 80% of all themes in research studies are usually dis discoverable with two to three focus groups with a modal size of eight participants. So we ended up doing two, two, two hour focus groups. That's one in Sydney, one in Melbourne with 18 sessional staff. Um, uh, so the school of, uh, in, from School of Engineering and Technology and School of Business and Law in Sydney, we had nine participants and in Melbourne, we had nine participants. Um, after the, data was gathered. So our analysis was, um, uh, we adopted a thematic analysis approach. Obviously uh, we got the, the interviews were transcribed by a third party. We then organized the, the data into themes that I will discuss. Um, um, we then looked at the textual content. We then interpreted the content and conclusions were drawn. So that's just a general a series of steps that are followed in thematic analysis and that's um, what we have done as well. So are there any questions at this stage that I can answer? So far, anything so far? If you have any, feel free to stop me. Chat room is active as well. Uh, Ritesh, one, yes. one, one tiny comment is that um, so I'm sure it's going to be covered soon, but so far <coughs> I haven't actually seen anything that, that is specific to session or staff that, is, that isn't applicable to everybody. So, that's, so I that's, guess that's coming. That is a very good point you're making, Ken. In fact, that's one of the conclusions that we draw is the findings are not applicable. This is what we gathered from sessional staff. And that, what that means is we are able to validate our findings with existing studies that are similar or that have shown similar results. Does that make sense, Ken? So, and so you're so you're trying to. Um, we went to sessional staff. Yeah. And the findings, and I'm am going to come to findings. Okay, I guess that's really the. Sure. The, those findings will be the nub of what what I guess I'm I'm getting at, which I'm sure everybody's realised yep. as well. And I mean, like exactly what is specific about sessional staff. I mean, so far everything's wonderfully um, specific to to all of us. You know, yep. Not just which is staff. which is uh, which is the point I will make as well. Okay, no problem. Thanks, Ken.
so here are some preliminary findings and I've said preliminary because we're still kind of, uh, well, the paper is almost done. We're just reviewing it before we submit. So this was qualitative research as I've demonstrated in that previous slide. Um, sessional staff identified the following problems. Contract cheating. If you look at those quotes and you try to, to, to um, identify the reasons more profitable to either purchase or copy paste from the internet rather than spending time on assessments. This is what, you know, staff is saying about their perception of what the students think. You know, they, they, they are obviously talking to, to students. So that means students are saying, well, we don't have to be spending too much time. We might rather just go and purchase or copy paste from the internet. Um, so, Ritesh, if I can just add there, um, yeah. one person actually said that a student told them they can get paid $60 an hour to work, but they only pay $30 an hour for somebody to write their assignments for them. So it was more profitable for them to go to work instead of spending that time writing their assignments. Um, so as the, the court also illustrates further, time that could be spent on working and earning money. Um, the, the, the logic again is whether it is $60 or whether they get paid, paid $20 an hour, the student. You know, their logic still is they can spend that time more wisely, see, perception, earning money, and then pay someone else to do the assessment. And it's, it's more uh, a calculated concept of return on investment here rather than looking at the, the learning aspect. And, and, and when you consider, and one of, one of the data did point out to the fact that, you know, staff is saying, we obviously don't want cheaters because what these students are doing is unethical. Um, then inappropriate referencing. They have falsified citations. And staff said, sometimes we necessarily don't go and check every citation that is provided. You know, we see that a citation is there, but then there are others who, who read the citation, then go and see whether that statement is actually coming from the work they've cited. If they haven't, that means that is also a case of academic misconduct. So they've, they've falsified citations, so they don't read the citations, just randomly pop in text references and the in-text reference has no bearing on the preceding sentences and those kinds of things. And it is my understanding, Faye comes across many of these cases on a regular basis. I was just gonna say, Ritesh, I have dealt with a huge number of those cases this term and, um, and, you know, and, and in previous terms as well. And look, you're quite right. That's one of the ones that does concern me a little bit because I have to admit, I'm one of those people who I probably would not necessarily check in depth. You know, you might have a bit of a, a quick look at what the citate or what the, the name of the the, um, the reference is or whatever. But um, yeah, this seems to be a fairly wide practice. Students believe that by popping, randomly popping in a few references, um, you know, it will make their their um, assessment item look like they've done the work. Um, but in fact, the, the uh, things that they've referenced actually have nothing to do with what they've actually said. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Ritesh, to interrupt here. <laughs> Just uh, another note on this. Um, um, do you have any statistics that saying that how many um, academics or how many lecturers are actually checking every reference? Because when you're looking at it, I mean, from, from a um, lecturer's point of view, if you want to actually thoroughly check every reference, then you end up reading 10 papers for every assignments. Um, if I, how's, I that, how's this qualify, quantified and, and how do you approach this? Um, what, uh, Joe here, um, what I did when I'm directing people about marking, I would just ask them to do spot checks. So like if the, um, I forget, I think the assessment asked them to do 10 references. So I just said, can you do spot text checks on two? 
So it's not like they're looking at every reference, but you know, if they're going to manipulate some, um, you'll pick it up by checking one or two references. That's how I dealt with it. Could I just jump in here? Sorry? Can I, can I just jump in here? It's on, it's on yep. the same topic. I was just going to say I've got two acronyms I use when I mark. First thing I do is print or look, I have on a separate page or a screen the list of references and I go through the um, work and I go through the reference list. NC means not cited, NIRL means not in reference list. That's what I do every time. Yeah, the, these ones though, Marilyn, that have been picked up, they've actually referenced it and it is a real paper, but sometimes it's either, you know, I, I, I've seen one not that long ago where it was actually written in a different language. So I suspect the student probably didn't read it. Um, and some of them which really, you know, it, it's got maybe one keyword or something, but it's not actually, you know, so a lot of times that, I don't know, some of the ones that I've looked at were on artificial intelligence or something, but it was artificial intelligence in use in a particular medical procedure or something. And what they were talking about was in the finance sector or, you know, they just, they've just kind of done a really quick search online, I can only assume, picked up something, oh yeah, it's got that word in it, pop, straight in it goes, and it's not, nothing to do with what they're actually talking about, so. No, I was actually go, also going to go on and say that it's not the first, I don't only do a one run through, I actually read it through twice afterwards, so I'm probably causing myself far more work than yeah. normally. However, once you put um, start putting not cited in an RL throughout, yeah. students understand that you are actually looking at their work. For yeah. that, does that answer your question? Well, well um, um, yes I, I mean, and no, I might because... Just, I might just go back to your initial, do, do we have uh, numbers, quantity? You were, you were talking in terms of quantity. Yeah, no, I think um, uh, my question is, is that how much is relevant to your research? Yes. The fact that um, to find out how many people, how many lecturers are actually thoroughly checking the references. Yeah. No, we didn't, we didn't ask that question, but that is where, see, now the, it's actually, and this is, this is where the, it's the onus of the markers. And I think what Marilyn and Faye have just, you know, in terms of examples, they've provided their own practices of how, and, and, and Joe, for example, said, you know, out of every 10, you go and pick a, a couple, to, to check, because that is just to ensure that you haven't missed anything. And and I, I think that this is a point I'll, I'll perhaps make in the next slide, is how important it is for markers to not let these things drop by from our radar. Rikish, do you mind yep. if I jump in? Um, sure. I'm telling my experience in one of the units in project management, Thank you. actually. Yep. What I found is really very effective is uh, I posted a learning list with all about 20 references. So I posted this in the Moodle and I asked the student to use the 10th, the 10 references that it's asked for, or whatever among, like should be among this list. So the students are more aware that I, like I already know the list. So they have the feeling that I may be more familiar with the references so they can't falsify the references. And it was really effective. So even the student feedback was like, put them in a right track directly to go through the direct list of references through the Moodle because you already uploaded the list. There is a small, um, actually something in the Moodle you can build on uh, your list and then the students can navigate these references for this assessment. So can I just clarify there? So you, so you saying that you found the references and you upload the references and said the students can use these 20 references that are in the Moodle site. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. It's, it's like you uploaded, let's say you ask the student to use 10, you upload like 20 or 25 references, and then you, sh you ask the students to use these references for this assessment. I, okay, well, <clears throat> that's one approach, but I, I was going to say with um, like professional skills, <clears throat> one of the skills you're teaching them is how to search for the references themselves. So you're sort of 
by giving them the, I can see what you're doing by giving them the references though, then you're not, <clears throat> then you can't then assess how they search for references themselves or their own searching skills. Yeah, I guess I guess this is undermining this kind of um, this undermining uh, like a partial uh, part of the research, the purpose of the research, which is finding the references and reading the paper. And that's yeah, that's true. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with that. But in the same case, we've got like more than one assessment. So for the final assessment, they will be able to be built by that by that time they will be able to build that knowledge. So. You, We've got like two approach. One is the discussion forums, which is like frequently scaffolding assessments every two weeks. So the students can have this reference list like available. But then for the final assessment, they already know that where they have to go. Interesting, thank you, that's good. Um, so uh, continuing on the problems is staff have, have also identified that students have started to manipulate plagiarism detection software, turn it in, right. because they have started using synonym generators. Now, as you know, you know synonym generators will will change the the sentence. Will use synonyms, and often the meaning is lost. I mean, and when we are reading the assessment item that's when we have to detect whether that mean whether the sentences actually convey any meaning or not because once a synonym generator is used that the sentences or the extracts that they've copied from elsewhere will will easily go through the turnitin software and hence you know if the software is not picking it up the onus again is in the markers to identify and uh, with discussions with, uh, with with other staff, you know they they've all experienced that, and I'm sure some of you. So, how many of you have actually experienced that? You know, students using synonym generators. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to say that, that was actually that, that are just incoherent. Sorry, Kate. So sorry, Ken. Um, it's surprising actually. That one often what I see is it kind of. <laughs> It looks like it's just a spattering of pink across the page when you look at the at the um, Turnitin report because Turnitin seems to be it is surprisingly sophisticated and it, it it sees the same sort of order of of content often and it will pick up even if if it doesn't seem to pick up even more than two words together it, it will still kind of pick that up but but of course the the score then I had again. Earlier this week, the aviation team asked me what the magic Turnitin number was. So I had I had the conversation again about the fact that there is no magic. There is no number. So. Now, uh, uh, Faye, you might recall a couple of terms ago when I had this uh, this um, incident of, of student uh, academic misconduct. What these students had done is 80% of the assignment was similar to two groups and it was not picked up by Turnitin. It was picked up by the marker. And, you know, if the marker was not vigilant while it was being marked, there was no way we would have indicted these eight students for pleasure. Certainly with, with, with the, the um, synonym generator, I'd have to say, I really uh, um, would say to everyone, one of the things is to look uh, whether the sentences do make sense, because I've got to say, some of the ones I have seen, wow, that is just a nonsense. Or alternatively, it can be enormously funny when they have put in a weird word <laughs> that doesn't belong. <laughs> hmm. yeah. uh, Kieran has just put in the chat room, he says, we see a combination of false citations and synonym engines in that unit there. Students are asked to summarize one resource. However, they choose one resource, run parts of the text through a synonym engine and cite it as being from another resource. Now see, that is evident academic misconduct there. Um, and that I think Kieran brings me to the next problem that staff see. We're focusing on the problems. Academic dishonesty. People come from a different system. They're not used to this particular system. And it's very hard at the age of 20 really to shift from one system to another system and the mind shift to take place. So I think the onus again is on the educational institution and 
us as teachers is to bring that cultural shift. Now that cultural shift could be as simple. So when I think from an educational perspective, and I, I think we're already practicing it, it could be, you know, lots of posters around the campus. When students are looking at it, they know that we know. And I come back to what we said earlier on. It could also, and it is very important for us to be talking to students about it. And being vigilant. We should not let these incidents go. Like seriously, there is no way, the moment you spot it, I do understand it takes time. This is one of the problems that staff identified. They said resolving these cases, putting them into a system takes time. But the problem is if we don't put it into the system, then students have essentially taken us for a ride. And they know that I went to XYZ's class last term. I cheated. No one noticed. So I might do it again. Or even worse, they'll say that XYZ you know, didn't bother. So in other words, there is also that element of your own integrity then that comes to foray. Um, so uh, just moving ahead to what were the implications? Staff should adapt their teaching practices to include academic integrity issues. Talk to them, send them emails. I regularly, twice a term, I send them emails. In fact, over the last two terms, I've been telling my staff, don't talk about plagiarism, talk about contract cheating. Show a video, I send them the video. I tell my staff, talk to your students about contract cheating so they should be aware that we know. Staff need to better design assessments to reduce academic misconduct incidents. So there is a lot of literature that says that. I know it can be difficult at times um, trying to, to, to um, better design assessments, but obviously one of the simple strategies, at least every term change the assignment. If you have a case study, you know, change the case study every term. Um, and often, I mean, I know my assessment item is available online. I've seen it, but so when, and I saw it last term and I was like, okay, case study is available. All I had to do was go and change the case study. You know, the, the rest can still be the same, but that obviously does not mean, and I haven't checked whether it will be available next time. I will obviously go back and check retrospectively so that changes can be made. I know a lot of you are, uh, are introducing other ways of assessment, such as uh, getting students to, to, to record videos and submit. Um, In-class um, assessments are being conducted, but these are all different ways, and that does not take away from your conventional assessment strategies as well. You know, report writing is important. You know, an IT analyst who does not know how to write a report um, can be in trouble or will face problems in the workplace when they're actually asked to write a report. So, you know, you just have to find that sweet spot of how you balance your assessment items. Uh, in terms of the future, future studies can outline strategies to mitigate these problems um, and also identify ways to build academic integrity concepts into teaching. I did, and I will just look at, uh, stop there for a sec and let you look at that for a minute. This is coming from a paper that was published in 2004, 10 principles of academic integrity. Someone made this, this cartoon out of it in 2011 and it's got four steps, model, design, recognize and educate. Now, when we say model, now model here also means Model here also alludes to the fact that we are vigilant because we are a model to our students. And often, you know, and I'm sure some of you have read feedback, they might come in your Moodle feedback, they'll say, well, I heard from a student that the same assignment was there last time. So is that a problem? Uh, well, we can, we can sit and debate about it. But like I said, you know, you have to find your sweet, your sweet um, spot there. Yeah, can I, can I just, I, I do want to say something there. I mean, I have seen certainly students where 
The copied assessment was from a previous term. That's always a concern to me. Um, now, don't get me wrong, in some cases, <laughs> It was the, the staff member had changed the assessment item and that was part of the reason why it was picked up was because the student was still answering the question from the previous term, mm. um, which was not current. So um, it is, I, I, I just want to really reiterate what Ritesh is saying. It is super, super important that um, assessments are changed each term. And, um, and certainly, I know most of you are doing that, but. Uh, Tony uh, has put a comment in the chat um, room there. He says, I never use the word plagiarism, copying or contract cheating in my classes. I always use the term academic integrity, trust and reputation, including their students own to refute this behavior at the beginning. So far, it seems connecting the message and the purpose. Tony, um, well, it's an approach that appears to be working for you. That's fine. Uh, in terms of whether you want to use academic integrity plagiarism, contract cheating. Like I said, you know, I use the word contract cheating because I want my students to really know that I know about it. Because often, they, you know, if we don't use the word contract cheating, uh, they'll just go out and get the assignment made and say, well, my teacher doesn't know, he doesn't care. His focus only seems to be on plagiarism. His focus seems to be on the word academic integrity in general. So yes, it's an approach that's working for you. As I defined in the first slide, you know, academic integrity or breaches of academic integrity can take different forms. And they could be plagiarism, self-plagiarism, collusion, cheating, contract cheating. Um, thanks, Tony. Um, um, in terms of in terms of collaboration, you know, they, they, there's a lot of emphasis from professional accreditation accreditation bodies like the Australian Computer Society, and I'm sure it's the same for the Project Management Institute, Ronnie. Uh, that there is emphasis on um, on um, students developing teamwork skills, and. And as a result, what we have all started doing is we are incorporating more teamwork, group activities in our assessments. That's fine, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't lead to, to collusion. It, it shouldn't lead to any um, incidents of cheating. So we have to be wary of, of, of that aspect as well. In terms of design, um, I know a lot of you personally out there in the, the chat room, ask students to show you a draft of the assessment item. It really works well. Because then you know that the student's actually progressing. You know that, you know, you know, you know their writing style. And if they're incrementally showing you their progress, then you can be assured that they're not uh, um, contract cheating. Um, recognize, uh, we've talked about phrase matching, uh, we've talked about synonym generators, and um, and finally educate, educate your students. It, it talks about honor codes there, and I, I think honor code here, um, I, I remember speaking to another colleague, and that was if there's a group of four and one of them says, well, if, if we're caught in plagiarism or contract cheating, I will confess and the other three will be let free. And I think Faye knows that because she gets a lot of those cases, but that's something again, you have to be um, be aware of, of these internal honor codes. I, I had not heard that one before about yeah. Yes. Someone is someone volunteering <laughs> to take the um the heat. Um, Ritesh, there's a, a couple of people have just written to me privately with <clears throat> ideas of practice of what they do. Do you want to just throw it open to people if they just want to, you know, put forward something that they do so that they can share their good practice? Yep. Yep. Please, uh, if anyone's got any ideas, uh, I will. If you just give me a minute, I'll come back to that, Joe. Okay. Uh, Mohammed Adin says, I strongly encourage students to say no to plagiarism and academic misconduct and know that it hurts. That's a good point, uh, Mohammed, because um, 
and I'm sure a lot of you do it. I talk in terms of monetary value, saying $3,500 is how much you lose if you're going out there. Um, I think Shreeman's <laughs> online, uh, spoken to Shreeman as well about it, and he does that too. So we talk in terms of money because that is a pain point. You know, you can spend so many hours working out there, but you know, if you, you fail and you come back and you give the money back to us, um, it's really a shame. Absolutely, Rita, so just like to also share one thing when Joe said, like students, uh, I heard a few times, like students, they, they got 150 bucks an hour, you know, 60 bucks an hour. Truly, in, uh, in capital cities, they struggle to make even, I believe, 25 bucks an hour to 30 bucks an hour, you know? So this all probably they like to escape from really the need to do the job and uh, like to do their study, but they might be comment only for just get rid of uh, out of this issue. But in reality, exactly every lecture or every attend uh, like in the um, uh, session we talk about the how much money they could make whole term to save uh, for their fee and how much really they pay only one subject if they pay. It is absolutely not a tool and not possible for them to pay half of the fee of one unit if they even True. work full time. Yep. Um, um, I agree. Sorry, Steve has just sent, sent a message there saying that um, he gets them to write a biography in the first in the first tutorial. So he's got a sample of writing. Um, and I think that's a good idea. Um, I used to in professional skills I used to the first assignment was um, partly writing a biography writing about yourself and what you wanted to do with your degree and students plagiarized that they plagiarized their biography it's like you know, so but I, I dealt with some of those cases and I, you, why you've just uh, I've just asked you to tell me about yourself that's right it was an easy five marks they just had to write about themselves but they plagiarized and I remember saying to the markers, you need to check, uh, you need to check the, um, uh, turn it in. And they were saying, but why? They're just writing about themselves. And then I was like, oh my God, they, they copied it. So, um, but I think what Steve is saying, he actually gets them to do it in class in the first tutorial so that he has a sample of the handwriting. So that might be a good way to go. So I like that suggestion. All right. Now, before I open it up for further discussion, there's just this concluding slide that I will quickly... Okay, so unfortunately, some academic misconducts are increasing um, and contract cheating seems to be on the rise. A cultural shift is required and I do know CQ Uni is making progress in leaps and bounds because trust me, we are one of, I shouldn't even say one of the few, we are perhaps the first university that is doing a lot in terms of policies and procedures about academic integrity, having staff that are dedicated to academic integrity, um, staff that are actually reporting academic misconducts back to TEXA. Um, because I, I mean, I, I know this, I've been talking to the academic integrity team, so we are really uh, progressing. Um, so please equip yourself to deal with academic integrity incidents if there are things that um, are unclear, you know, talk and, to uh, say it. Um, Ritesh, um, one, just, sorry. Uh, one thing I'd like to know, if, the, if there is any uh, attempt to turn it in, to check with the opportunity to enhance, turn it in, uh, check for uh, figures and also for PDF reports, because in these two things, we can't do anything you know but i believe a lot of figures should be taken from the literature but it's not really referred by a student as his own source or even from where it is you know mm -hmm. yeah. can i just say also that if you are suspicious of um whether a, a student has engaged in contract cheating um i'm happy for you to get in contact with me and also I can, um, if, if we think it's, it's worthwhile, um, we can get the academic integrity team to do some additional checks such as the, um, the Turnitin authorship tool, et cetera. Um, look, this is super important. And I, I was really, really pleased when Ritesh um, and Joe uh, contacted me about this because I, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen, um, there's a, there was another, um, 
article on this recently, um, and, you know, in terms of the, the fact, oh, apparently, you know, if they're all international students are contract cheating and it's rife and everything. And look, unfortunately, it is, it, it certainly is a lot more common than any of us would like to think, I believe. However, I do also think that it is, um, it, it is one of those things where we do need to be really, really vigilant and we need to be uniformly vigilant. Um, one of the things that worries me a little bit is that I believe that some of the unit coordinators are being really excellent at doing this. Um, and I think perhaps some people are not being quite so vigilant. Um, you re we really need to all be on our toes with this. In the end, remember, this reflects really badly on our institution and on us if um, students are not um, behaving with integrity. And importantly, probably one of the most important things that I have taken away from a fair amount of the discussions that I've had around um, academic integrity is that it's, it's a concern because in the end, the student has not met the learning outcomes for your unit if they have engaged in these behaviours. And that's a, that's a huge concern for us. So as, as educators, that's really, after all, isn't that what we're all here for? So, um, and I know sometimes it seems like you're kind of being a bit tough on them if you raise a case. But again, we need to be giving a really, really uniform message this is not behaviour that is acceptable. And the good thing is if you do it early, oftentimes they only get a fairly minor sort of slap over the wrist, not so much for contract cheating, I'll admit, but, um, but it's a fairly minor penalty often and hopefully they get the message then. So just following on from that, Faye, <clears throat> I think one thing that perhaps we could try is to use that peer pressure. So, you know, like it's okay for the academics to be saying this in class or whatever, but we need to, your point there about, you know, they're not meeting learning outcomes. We need to, to get students to, like other students to police this. So perhaps by saying, if you know that other people are cheating and you allow this to happen or you turn a blind eye, that's actually devaluing your degree because if they go out and get a job and, you know, and they're useless at what they're doing and it's because they cheated the way through their degree, that will actually devalue the degree that those people who worked really hard to get will happen. So a bit of, I think we, we also perhaps need to look a bit more at, at using other students to help us with this. That's a good point, Joe, and I think I might point out that the TEXA guideline now says that whistleblower, sorry, academic institutions need to protect whistleblowers. So they are encouraging whistleblowers and they are also talking about the protection of whistleblowers. So when you talk peer pressure, you know, by all, I mean, if students come out and complain about others, well, I think we all have to assist and take corrective action. So uh, proactive measures, which we've discussed a lot of them over punitive measures. And finally, you know, become detectives, academic integrity slits. And when I was doing the presentation yesterday, I could find that image and I thought it looked like Joe with a magnifying glass. So I put that in there. <laughs> um, well, that's it from me. Thank you so much. I, uh, we, the floor is open now. If there's any questions um, that uh, you'd like us to address, we're happy to take them. Uh, perhaps if I could make a comment here, uh, research. I think that this research is heading in, in a good direction in, in that, um, see, see we, we're all faced with time pressures. It's one of the main reasons we can't follow up on so many cases. But in the past, um, a weak spot has been the fact that so many of our markers are sessional staff. Our markers are sessional, they're, they're casuals, and they can't be expected to apply the same level of rigour that that we generally do with these sorts of things, yet they're on the front line doing all the marking. So, so this sort of research and the, the approach to make sure that our sessionals are educated about it um, is going to obviously uh, start to make an impact because, um, you know, uh, that, in other words, we're, we're able to spread that load much more now. Um, I, I agree that that it's it's a huge cost time-wise with that. and. Um, 
I must say from like talking to the sessional staff, like before and after the actual focus group, they really, really liked the opportunity to have their voices heard um, because some of them, um, you know, obviously working with um, the type of academic that Faye was saying not to be, that is that someone who's brushing it aside, I don't care, it's taking too much time or whatever. And some of them, you know, were really quite, um, Upset's not the right word, but you know it concerned them a lot because you know they're finding this out, pointing out to the coordinator who was then sort of ignoring it because it would take too long to to deal with that. So yeah, I mean, because our teaching model, especially in ICT part of the school, relies so much on sessional staff, I think I think we need to work more with the sessional staff about what the ideas that they have and also how to make it better so that they can get the marking done in the time that's allocated to them because, you know, we streamline processes and how we do the checking, et cetera. Now, as a sessional, can I join in? I may be the only sessional attending. I'm not too sure. Uh, no, you're um, not, but it's good to hear from you. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Look, look, just two examples from myself. I've been both a, um, a sessional lecturer, tutor and a sessional coordinator. Um, there's been an example where, again, I took a writing sample, um, gave people 20 minutes and one student only wrote the word the on a piece of paper, uh, yet then handed in a brilliant 5,000 word assignment. Uh, at the end of the, the term, I escalated that, raised serious reservations and nothing was done about it. Um, so I personally would have failed the entire class of about 13, 14 students. The English was better than mine, citations were better than mine, um, yet they could barely write English. So in a case like that, what's the escalation process? Because I was then complicit through no fault of my own that these people passed. So who do I escalate that to? Probably me, Steve. I'm the Deputy Dean of Learning and Teaching, so yeah, I mean, look, you, certainly you can um, talk to your, um, to your head of course, obviously, yep. but um, in the end, it will end up with me. Okay, the other example, which wasn't me, um, a session will spent about 12, 12 or 15 hours of their own time recently, um, failed 60% of their cohort. Uh, this was term two, uh, escalated that to the coordinator, who just overwrote her, they all passed. So. Again, I would suggest then you need to speak to um, probably the head of course and me, because that's really not okay. Yeah, agreed. We, we, we do sort of have a little bit of a conflict in, in that um, all, all of our, our KPIs to some extent are based on student satisfaction and pass rates and things like that. And, uh, and that, that can influence um, how tough someone might decide to be about looking for uh, uh, cases. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if a marker fails 60%, that's going to have a huge impact on your pass rate. Yeah, correct. That's true, Ken, but I, I think... That's more important, know, pass rate or academic integrity? Integrity. I, and I'm afraid I'm... I, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. This is one of, in fact, I would probably easily say this is the least favourite part of my job. I, I don't enjoy this at all. I, I'm not a policeman, at, at, you know, naturally. I'm actually an educator. I want to help students. I, and I, so, know, I, I mean, I feel like that too. It, I, I, re, I absolutely hate this business of, of chasing a student down and all that. It really hurts me. Uh, to indeed. Be and, and look, doing that, but, but then we're I, doing it. We have to. We have to, Ken. I think that's the, I guess that's my kind of message is no matter the fact that we, none of us, I'm sure, enjoy this part of the job at all, um, but you just can't let it go. If you do, you're risking the integrity of the institution. You're risking your own personal integrity, frankly. You have, and, have to totally agree. And, and, and honestly, I've also dealt with a couple of cases, not too in the far distant past where a staff member has taken a different approach and it gets us into a lot of trouble when, when you do that. So I really think follow the policy. That's, you know, again, when I was a much younger academic, I'm not going to lie, at times I used to think, oh, damn, policies, you know, what a pain they are and everything. But the truth is, guys, they're there not just to protect students but also to protect us. 
And so if you follow the policy, then we're all protected hopefully and, and everything ends up okay. When you don't follow the policy, honestly, it sometimes gets us all into a fair bit of strife. So um, yeah, if you're not sure, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, th thanks for um, just to clarify. I certainly wasn't trying to imply that we should back off, you know, or or, or deliberately um, ignore a case just because of the KPI sort of thing. I wasn't trying to imply that. No, no, I, I know, I'm Ken. I know, but look, I, I completely get where you're coming from, and there is there is that conflict. And as I say, I think we, there's a the conflict we because because we don't we we there's that part in all of us that says no, I want to help this student, you know, but you know, and honestly. In a, in a previous life, it was okay. And we used to do things like just talk to students. Oh, no, that's not okay. You better, you know, you, uh, you know, make that better, you know, fix it up, resubmit, whatever. But that is a previous lifetime and we can't behave in that way anymore, unfortunately. I wish we could, but we can't. So... Fair. Um, I remember one time, yep. Faye, in one of the sessions, you raised the point that if there is any suspicious in one of the students, it's better if you go back to you and check the student's profile. If he has a history of contact yes. cheating, this will be really helpful. And I think and it's a valid point. Indeed, indeed. And that's a really good point because that honestly is the reason why you need to raise a case in the system because once that happens, then there's a record of that. So I can tell you right now that the penalties are very heavily reliant on the student's previous history. So if it's the student's first offence, particularly if they are in their first term of study or whatever, usually, unless it's contract cheating, they truly, they just get a little slap over the wrist. They get a downgrade of marks and, you know, and oftentimes they can still pass the unit. But if I look at a student and they've had a previous case, usually the penalty then is going to be fail for that assessment item. And anyone who gets to the third offence, they're a fail for the unit. No matter how minor, they're a fail for the unit. And that's because it's a pattern of behaviour by that stage. It's not just, oh, I made a mistake. No, it's, it's deliberate at that and, point. And this is why actually I find it really encouraging to report any case because you will be definitely know the history of the students and this will make like a common like feedback. Indeed, indeed, which is why we have the database, so. May I add something here, Faye, sorry. Um, uh, just going back to that policing and the prosecution part, which is unpleasant to everybody. Uh, in, um, I may mention another university that I work for uh, yes, before here. Um, there was a committee that they were assigned to actually follow up these cases and, uh, and doing the, all the policing and, and the prosecution. And all, all what the academics or the lecturers did was that to gather evidence and present it to the committee and that's it, I'll leave it there. And then the committee will have a outcome um, reported to the lecturer. Maybe that's one good thing we could probably follow up. Yeah, look, I, I, and, and I have raised that honestly, Fazad, with um, the learning and teaching services and everything. And honestly, I thought at one point that the university would set up such a committee at university level. It doesn't appear that that's going to happen. They have, however, at least got the academic integrity unit now and those people do, you know, they will assist us, particularly with the contract cheating cases. Um, look, I must admit, the contract cheating cases really, really bother me and the reason they really, really bother me so much is that the, the evidence is never black and white in contract cheating for fairly obvious reasons. And the penalties are really quite harsh. Um, I mean, even for fairly minor cases, you know, if the student sort of used a, a, a website or whatever, you know, it's, it's a minimum of fail for a unit. That, that's first offence, fail for the unit. And if it's something a bit more serious, it may even be fail and suspension for a term for the first offence. And we're talking about situations where, as I say, the evidence is not black and white at all. Um, and I must be honest, I have been thinking seriously about whether or not I should 
set up a committee at the school level? Because again, I imagined that the university would do that at university level. That doesn't appear to be happening. And um, I, I am very, very uncomfortable making those decisions by myself. Well, well beside that, uh, this making the decision is the, also um, the matter of the skills. I mean, um, uh, we are expecting every lecturer, every uh, academic to have all the very good, pro and this is a professional skills we're talking about. I mean, uh, policing, investigating, uh, prosecuting. Uh, I mean, uh, rather than uh, transferring all these skills uh, and expecting every lecturer to have all these skills in a, in an acceptable and, and you know reasonable level, um, it's it's. I think it's more reasonable to have a committee of a few uh, very very skilled people that they can do that do a better yeah. job than than yeah. we could do. Yeah. Now, look, I, I understand where you're coming from. And as I say, unfortunately, it doesn't appear that the university is going to um, take that up. But um, nonetheless, look, again, I encourage all of you, if you do have a case and you're suspicious about a student, um, please get in contact uh, because, frankly, it makes it a lot easier for you and me. I mean, the one thing I would say to you, though, is that when you do raise a case, um, Honestly, for you, once you've raised the case, generally, unless, unless there's something missing from the evidence that you've put in, usually your part is done at that point. Mine is not, but yours is generally done. So normally you would put it into the system, then the process is it goes to learning and teaching services. They ask the student to respond to the allegation. They get the student's response. And then finally, it comes to me for um, decision. So your part is actually done. Apart from then, you have to you have to you know downgrade their assessment mark or and change their grade at the end. But in effect, once you enter the evidence, your your part of the process is all but done. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I am going to have to go now. I'm sure that if anyone has any further questions um, for Ritesh or Joe, they'd be more than happy to um, take your questions offline. So thank you very much, Ritesh and Joe. Obviously a very, very interesting presentation and you've got lots of, of audience, so well done. <laughs> and lots thank of you. Questions. Thank you, Faye, for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.